peace, especially at a time of so much global turmoil. Um, and that it takes, peace is very possible, but it takes action from all of us. Um, so if we could start this morning's conversation, um, I would like to ask Dahlia to kick us off um, and take it away, Dahlia. Good morning, Your Holiness and everyone. In 2014, the protest, the Pacific protest, is started in Venezuela, especially in the city where I live, the Tachira State. There, I saw young people being under persecution by the national police and other security bodies of the country. My brother was injured just to protest at, in a pacific way. I was under persecution, and I saw a 14 years old boy killed by the national police. Therefore, in my country now, people hate each other, and I am trying to teach them to forgiveness. Therefore, I wonder if Your Holiness can share with me how do you teach people for forgiveness after the conflict? Thank you. I think uh, individual case, as yesterday, I think someone was a mother killed by someone, isn't it? Hmm? So such case, that's an individual case, is a uh, the revenge, same way killing. They then continuously go like that. No use. But then, community level, national level, I think it's something different. <laughs> so sometimes, you see, the demonstrations also express disagreement. That also relevant. I think in the last century, the, even you see Soviet Union, very powerful. Then uh, from Poland, the Kasa, Lake oh, you see, he started was it the, against they are rule. And then, repercussions uh, are Oh, firstly, I think Poland. They like Hunza, you see, I know we very well, we very well know each other. He loves me. So I admire him. You see, sometimes you see the national level or community level, just a tolerance. Then other side feel weakness. Stand firm against. Hmm? That I think is uh, sometimes uh, relevant, good. Okay. I'm from South Sudan, and um, we, we've been in the longest civil war, and we have, um, very many of us have not known anything beyond conflict. And so um, I took it upon myself to educate the young generation so that um, we grow up um, learning about peace so they can understand what uh, conflict management is at a very young Age. So I, I thought it's very, very important for the young people to grow up 
uh, learning the importance of peace and how we can work together in unity. And the challenge that I'm facing currently is that um, the young are not trusted because there's this intergenerational gap and the young generation are not believed to know what conflict is, to know what peace is. Most of the time we are told, you were just born the other day, so what do you know about what's happening? And I learned that you started at a very young age, at 15 years old, you went into leadership. So I just want to understand how did you, how were you able to connect between the older generation and your generation when you got into leadership position? Thank you. あれ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。
Yeah. So in any way, in any way, you see, uh, if political election, then something different. Otherwise, you see, don't care about other sort of view. You yourself work hard. Then time passes. You see, the things become clearer and more sort of honest people, truthful people, sort of recognize or appreciate. Okay. Holiness, I, I think sometimes the challenge is, especially when they're not only not taken seriously, mm -hmm. but sometimes when youth leaders have pushback, have obstacles by their elders. And Idris, why don't you share your story? Is it working? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure for me today to be in front of you and talking with you, Your Holiness. My name is Edris from Afghanistan. Uh, Your Holiness, when I was just Afghanistan. Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> Your Holiness, when I was just four years old, because of war, we were forced to migrate to Iran. And in Iran, when I was just seven years old, and I wanted to join a school, as same as all over the world, because all the children join a school at seven years old, my father registered my name and a school. But the problem was here, that our relatives were saying that you have to not register the name of your son at the school, because he has to work. He has to just uh, to have money for you, and he has to just pay money for the family. He's not, it's not necessary to join a school and study. But my father said, no, there is no problem. I, wa I will let my child to join the school and study. But after that, all of my relatives just they disconnected from us and they just said that we are not going to, be more um, to have more relation with you. And it was the reason that in 2016, I just came back, uh, I left my family and came back to Afghanistan. And it was in 2018, I, organized, I just established my own organization by the name of Tomorrow's Generation, in which in that we help girls and boys to join a school in rural places. Now, until now, we have just helped about 200 children to join a school. But one of the problems which, which we face, Your Holiness, is that when we enter to an e village, which uh, the old of people of that village are practicing a wrong tradition, which we are not agree. They are all in the, in the, are all saying that girls and boys have to not join a school, especially girls. This is one the, uh, the problem. My question from you, Your Holiness, is this. As a leader, as a leader who has experienced in this difficult situation, what is your suggestion to me when I face to this kind of problem, when I face to a village which they are practicing a wrong tradition? What can I do? What, what is your uh, suggestion for me, Your Holiness? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, uh, I mentioned some religious tradition. Uh, you see, the, some dist distinction, male and female. I think the Kasa, South Arabia, the female, is some Kasa. Discrimination. A little discrimination. So these are, I think now we have to wait uh, gradually. It's the time now changing. So more wider contact, then things gradually change. Otherwise, all to certain, it's a change, I think, uh, several centuries tradition. Change, uh, all the certain change, I think difficult. So, if, uh, if we really want to uh, big change, then you start a revolution. <laughs> that also is difficult to, to say. Uh, so some of thousand year old tradition is narrow-minded. Uh, it takes time, difficult to change immediately. 
So one way, I think like this kind of meeting, more wider contact from time to time. Uh, and because Af Afghanistan, Afghanistan, our neighbor, I think in the past, maybe uh, around 1,000 years, some connection with Af Afghan people. And also, I think Iran. Taxi North Korea, what's the cause of it? Persia. Persia. Hmm. So this, so some connection. But then sometimes, uh, religion, a little bit narrow-minded. Uh, it's difficult to uh, to criticize. While I myself, for example, I totally committed promotion of this harmony. So uh, some sort of uh, like discrimination, uh, so, so on. I think time change, time passes gradually can change. This mainly through education. Uh, Funde, you had a similar uh, experience in terms of pushback from uh, efforts. Why don't you share your story? Uh, good morning, Your Holiness. Uh, my name is Tunde Ugnyale from Nigeria. No, Nigeria. From Nigeria. And I bring greetings from Nigeria. Uh, Your Holiness, in my community, dispute conflicts are daily experience in my, com my community. And where I live, uh, these conflicts are as a result of uh, something as big as dispute over land ownership. And sometimes uh, they are as a result of minor uh, things like disagreement uh, among the um, traditional leaders uh, within the communities. And because of my education, I happen to live in different parts of Nigeria, and I can attest to the fact that this is actually uh, uh, a, a, a simil there is similarity that is happening everywhere. So it's actually the same, the narrative is, is similar. So because of this, as a Nigerian, as a concerned citizen, I decided to form an organization with the name Peace Peace Initiative two years ago to promote peace and peaceful coexistence in Nigeria. And so we have ambassadors of peace across the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. But sometimes we face our resistance with the traditional leaders. You want to go to, the, to a particular community to help them, to bring them together, to promote values like understanding, alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and all. Some of them tend to resist. So that is my challenge. So, and I know that you also started as a young leader. And so that I would like to know, Your Holiness, how were you able to overcome resistance to your work as a young leader, especially when you are connecting with traditional leaders or people who are older than you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, a difficult question. Uh, I think basically education, awareness, the reality. Uh, so take time. You have to work continuously. Then hopefully, this in this kind of meeting, uh, say in different places, sometimes in Arab area or in uh, Af Africa, so and then more publicity.
more awareness about the isolated nation. Not much know the, the world situation. Or oh, then just they look world their own area and narrow minded, short sighted. So this I think mainly ignorance I feel. So the uh, only method is to promote awareness. I, th I think the Africa, as I mentioned earlier, yesterday, there's some kind of union of Northern Africa and Eastern Africa, Western Africa, if possible. Then you see more, or uh, how should they, uh, more talks, more exchange, and that I think only way to help to open their mind. Otherwise, you see, they something a thousand year old their tradition, something really because of the stuck in their mind. Stuck, 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 stuck. Uh, in their mind. Tibet case also. I think my thinking. Uh, one time, you see, one, uh, my friend from Sikkim, you see, and now he no longer. Banya Oting. Now he, uh, once we discussed something, then he told me, he expressed to me, oh, your thinking very much advanced. So if the leader's thinking too much advanced and the people who are supposed to because of lead follow, follow, uh, follow. Uh, follow, you say, uh, not so, because of that. Oh, Chakata, Kuchi, the Sambu, Shuji, Dokuchi, Achi, and Mimanzo, the Achi, Musim Shichun, and Kangerza, Skajashenu. Yes. So this person told me uh, that uh, if the leader is too advanced, that the people cannot actually catch up with him, then that's going to be problematic. So this is quite natural. But then time passes. Uh, the people actually by themselves seeing, you see, these change some value, then no problem. Otherwise, uh, sometimes it's something new idea. Now, for example, when I uh, also they retired from political responsibility, or even you say, I think 1962, or democratic uh, draft, democratic constitution, because um, the other made. In it, is a one clause mentioned that Lama's power can change by two thirds of the parliamentarians. Representative. So at that time, uh, many people, you see, against that, they asked me uh, that because of the clause should remove. And then I insist, no. So like that. So, you see some new ideas, a new time, and new ideas, you see, come. And then some old people, they do not so they realize the value. And then we continuously, you see, carry our work. That's the only way. Okay. So, so sometimes uh, our youth leaders have learned that education is by itself not enough. Uh, and I want to ask Achim to talk about that. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, Your Holiness, uh, I'm from Somalia. Somalia. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was born during a time when conflict already started. Uh, there was a conflict, a violence disorder. I went through the education system. It was great. The formal uh, 2014, like I had this 
opportunity of becoming a beast leader. I remember of taking like yeah, one of your books, uh, Ancient Wisdom, and the modern world. Today we are talking about the ancient wisdom and the modern world. But there are those ones educated as well. And they are the ones who are making chaos, disorder, violence. They went through the same system. Uh, then the importance, we talked about the importance, the importance. But what kind of miseducation do they have and the mindsets that they are following? Like, uh, to me, I learned these systems. And there will be, there will be no time that I will have a gun to do something. But they have these mindsets for them to do conflict, chaos. So these mindsets, what should we do to those ones and to transform their mindsets? Kaza. Yeah. And uh, Cherry, I want to ask you to chime in because you have a similar concern. I, I feel uh, a simple answer uh, through dialogue, through talk, uh, one way. I think that's a better way to educate older people. Hmm? Now we are 21st century. The century-old sort of habit uh, no longer relevant to this world. So time always change. So you say, uh, argue with these people. And still, uh, not for us, they uh, change their mind. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, limited revolution. <laughs> Some sort of demonstrations, I think, not violent way, peaceful uh, revolution. Peaceful revolution. I think sometimes it is necessary. The movement by masses. And then the old people who their their brain quite sort of hard hard mm, should feel. Oh, now unless we change something, see their own sort of position. May face, may face some danger. But sometimes it's necessary. I think my own experience, when I was a young student, uh, seven, eight years old, uh, when I, I start a study, uh, I have no interest study. <laughs> On, only interest is play. So my tutor always give one whip to show me threat. So the, because apparently there's more or less violence, but very sincere motivation. And to some, some kind, sometimes to, see, to some people, that kind of method also, you see, necessary. So, uh, sometimes the people's movement, strictly non-violent way, some demonstrations. Okay, I feel that. Cherry. Hi. Hello. Uh, you are holding the uh, morning. One time, I, uh, I mentioned, you see, I met some Indian. Uh, then... I, I suggested a uh, certain sort of right, you see, 
in order to get some certain right. See, you should organize demonstration, and I will join. I mentioned. So sometimes it is necessary. Strictly non-violent, not weapon, just you see shouting. It's necessary. Huh? Hmm? I I am Cherry. I came from Myanmar. Now I'm working in research field on peace project of Myanmar. I noted that some conflict linked with uh, extremists, uh, nationalists, um, ethnics, um, some religious activities. So, so in Myanmar, uh, we are providing interfaith curriculums in primary and secondary education. Um, um, how do you think uh, religious um, terrorism? Mm -hmm. And some people, even though they got the qualified education, how they became terrorists? Yeah. That's right. That. I don't know. <laughs> I, th I think you should carry more research work. <laughs> As I mentioned yesterday, sometimes you see religious faith uh, used for a positive way, good. But sometimes religious faith also, you see, creates more division than other, as a day, religious follower consider something negative. So here, so here it's very important for us to understand as followers of Buddhist, um, Buddhism uh, where the Buddha has actually said that you know, there are many different mental dispositions of people. So accordingly, we need to uh, approach. And obviously, uh, the Dharma wheel we call Chungo. No, no, no. Dharma so, at the sermons that the Buddha gave. The first one at Sanat, and the second one at Rajagri, and third one, Yambuchasakasri. Vaishali. Huh? So these teaching, if you look, there are differences because of different audience. Buddha respect different mentality. So accordingly, he taught. So uh, we must recognize this is different faith, different tradition. And Buddhists must accept Muslim brothers, sisters. No right to impose the uh, Muslim should follow Buddhism. No, no right. Buddha himself give right. So then we are a tiny follower. There's so no right to impose or say they, your own faith. And particularly this moment, you see, it is very important to promote religious harmony. In that, that reality, according to that reality, we must respect different tradition, no matter how or say the contradictory philosophy. No problem. So that the remainder comes on the one as well said that I think uh, generally, as I mentioned earlier, I think we should look human society more as a wider way, not sort of because of that one view. Then naturally there are. Uh, each individual because of their way of life. 
and also they they also have some wider contact and more so the information. So they are way of thinking something different. So religious for religion, I think pluralism very important. You cannot say my religion is best. You cannot say that. I never say. I never state Buddhism is best. No, as I, I think yesterday I mentioned. So, so I think Burmese uh, Buddhist brothers, I think should understand the people uh, who have some, I think, some tradition of Muslim. We must respect respect. Any human society, different religious faith, very possible. So, oh, we should think uh, according to reality. Uh, time pass, time already gone. Impose your own faith. This is my record. Okay. Next question. Luisa. Hello, your uh, My name is Luisa. I'm from Colombia. Uh, I remember when I was a child, I lived in a constant fear because of my dad's job. He used to work in one of the most dangerous areas in Colombia. Uh, I was lucky because even if my dad faced many times the guerrilla group FARC, he, unfortunately, I could grow up with him but I know many people that didn't have that opportunity to grow up with their parents. Right now, I'm working in order to bring people together to contribute to peace building in Colombia. So I'm working with victims, with young people, and also with former combatants. My question is that um, I feel that in this important moment on peace building, it's important to heal ourselves first. And I'm, I'm wondering from your experience, what do you think is the best way or what is your advice to educate ourselves in spirituality for a mental health, for a healthy mind, healthy heart, and healthy body? I think uh, that also uh, one way, first, you yourself, you see, uh, create peaceful mind and your whole way of life, more peaceful way, and makes example to other. But another, I feel, the analyze or uh, the different sort of, uh, sort of different different way of life, hmm? and then analyze which is better. As we already sort of, or say the, uh, the present world, a lot of crisis, mainly our own creation. Uh, so seeing that, then think how to change that. Then, as I mentioned earlier, education is a key factor. So not other way, or we should start some different education. No. Seeing the re situation and a lot of drawbacks, right? oh, then raise the question why it happened and further 
sort of investigate. Then, from childhood, they, as I mentioned yesterday, you see the education, not only material value, but inner value. Like that. So, the, so, so firstly, we should, I mean, because we should know the problem. Hmm? If the situation, present situation, remain continue, th this problem will remain, and the population increasing, and the global warming also now increasing. So more problem happen. So then, firstly, I think we should show the problem. Then there's no other choice except you should do something. Marve. That's not enough just to say we, yeah, we should do it. Yeah, we should do Hmm. So, Zon is asking if there are any uh, organizations which uh, who actually help such people who have, you know, uh, who are uh, go to so special this. class or a spiritual so, yeah. something special. So, the, I think organization or class, you see, to those young people who really disturb their mind. Then, you see some experienced people share also their way of thinking and then let them discuss. Trauma healing. Then there's not much choice. Too much sort of disturb mind. Then finally, violence. Violence, no use. More problem. So maybe um, you know you could uh, organize um, s sessions with such people who have uh, you know, undergone traumatic experiences uh, with the help of experts. And his audience was saying that we need to actually see and appreciate the problems first and then see whether the problems could be, um, can be overcome or not. If there is a way out of the problem, then we should actually work for that. So, to put um, within the context of the, the teaching of the Buddha himself, the Buddha in his first sermon gave teaching on the Four Noble Truths. And so he started out with the teaching on suffering. So to, to, to make us acknowledge the condition that we are in, so that we can actually see uh, whether there is a cause of, of suffering or not. And if there is a cause of suffering, which he says it's the origin of suffering, as it's called, then uh, you need to actually see whether that origin of suffering can be overcome or not. And therefore he said, he taught the, that of what is known as a true cessation, whereby you, uh, which is the state of overcoming the suffering that we have. And for that he taught the path, the true path. So in this way, uh, you know, you, um, he, the Buddha began by, uh, by teaching on suffering, and then also to show the path out of that. Like I think illness, unless the person, you see, realize he got some illness, then they develop desire uh, to take some medicine to cure. But the person feel, oh, I have not, no wrong, nothing wrong, perfect. It came in the world. 
So in any situation, we must acknowledge what's the problem first in order to be able to overcome. I think in order to open human mind, I think problem is good. When we see problem, then open our mind. Then try to method to overcome that. Other hand, oh, everything, okay, very good. Then uh, never make effort. Oh, next. Your Holiness. <laughs> Your Holiness, we've just discussed, you know, the kind of education that helps helps one to do that kind of analysis, uh, to to have the personal healing that allows you to do that. Also, the challenges that a young leader faces, particularly if there's traditional resistance or elder resistance, and sometimes how education is not enough, and it can still lead to accepting violent ideologies. Um, so I want to ask our youth leaders if they have, if that spurs any additional questions, um, having just covered all of those key challenges that you face. Dahlia? Your Holiness, all the young leader, peace builder here are living in countries under conflict. By example, I am giving them young people tools to fight for their own rights, but in a peaceful way. But at the same time, I have to deal each day with all the conflict around me. So I wonder if you can share with us or with me some advices or strategies to keep the peace in my mind to keep doing my work as peace builder, keeping my mind in peace and my healthy hair and my body health. Thank you. Because <laughs> Difficult to say. But this our meeting, one example, world, global level, a lot of problem. So we seeing these problem and demoralize. No. Huh? After seeing more sort of uh, problems, then we develop the how what are the causes of this problem? Then, whether there is way to overcome or change these causes, then make effort. If there is uh, no way to, to tackle these causes, then, then I think alcohol, rest. <laughs> That's not a human way. Uh, human, uh, whether there is... Creation, creator or not, this brain is something very special. So in order to utilize this brain, uh, we should face we should face more problem. Then this brain becoming more active. So I think this is one example. There's a lot of problem. We never say now no hope or demoralize, not that way. Make it, try to analyze what the causes and whether these causes can change or not. So we are making effort. Otherwise, I think we should pray <laughs> the, through also the, according to some sort of Indian tradition text mentioned, the eventually whole 
Grexis Burn. Oh, get what I mean, Jig? Destroyed by fire. So then, uh, better to pray for that end of end of world should come sooner than better. <laughs> <laughs> that also extreme. Now, mm, at least you see the present all world good, isn't it? Mm. Then some problem. Uh, we must think how to solve this problem. We utilize our intelligence and more realistic, not just ho hope, uh, analyze the causes. Uh, then, accordingly, try to uh, make effort. This way, I feel. So if, if we can do this quickly, Tunde and Paula, short. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Yes. 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 Thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, Your Holiness, you just mentioned the fact that sometimes a peaceful demonstration is the best way to solve a problem. I agree, but then I have a challenge. Your Holiness. Uh, some times ago in Nigeria, uh, something like that was done, especially in Northeast Nigeria, Jola, Adamawa State. A peaceful demonstration was hijacked. And this thing, the, the, the protest was supposed to be peaceful, but it was led by uh, some um, religious leaders. At the end of the day, it turned out to be something worse. So I was wondering whether you have some uh, word of advice for us on how to go about this so that a peaceful demonstration will not be turned to something else, something Just unintended totally. Something violent. Karza. Violent. And if I could interject, I, I would like to invite everybody to visit the U.S. Institute of Peace website, usip.org. We have a lot of training materials and something called the SNAP Guide that is very specific training and strategies for how to ensure that nonviolent action truly remains nonviolent, because there are a lot of specific strategies available. Um, and, it, and if I, we could get Paula one more question before you answer. Uh, thank you so much, Your Holiness. Uh, this has been Sandra very good. Could no. to, to the, no. Now, that is, I think, the uh, impatience. So, although, you see, you start the right way, oh, but then a mm, lot of obstacles come. Then our patience lost then through impatience, frustration, then violence. So the, I think in Tibet case, they basically we always you see, avoid violence. Any mission da da soya mebche so 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 because uh, Tibetans stick to nonviolence, and therefore when people actually protest against the, you know, the regimes, um, in, instead of going forth to you know, harm others, people actually burn themselves. Mm. So that also, I think, mm, desperate practice of nonviolence you see, sacrifice their own life, burned. 
a such person. Certainly, she can do harm other by the disdain. And instead of harming other, self burn. So, Thank you. Thank you. So some rather than was in love with Shingmarty, she did it at and we won't go to Malikro. So, so self immolation, of course, uh, you know, attracts a lot of attention from people, and there's awareness raised of what's going on in, you know, in some place. And the, but here, you must, must not take to uh, that His Holiness is advising you to go, I mean, commit self immolation as such. Okay, uh, Your Holiness, um, as a young person, more often uh, we approach very, very many issues, and sometimes we are not ready for the issues that we approach. I, I, I want to give to myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so most often we get into situations that are very, very tough for us as young people. And one thing I would like to no, know is if you have any experience or a, a time where you are overwhelmed because you're trying to solve an issue, if you can share that with us and would like to know how you overcame certain issues because most of us end up getting ourselves in situations where we are stuck and we don't know how to go, uh, how to come out of such situations. So I would like to know from your experience when you get uh, into situations that are very, very hard and you're Kasa. overwhelmed. Kasan, <laughs> I usually feel that the certain aim you are making effort, it is really uh, analyze that sort of aim, something beneficial, something good, reasonable, then there is no way, I mean, uh, no reason to demoralize, make effort, effort, effort. And here also it is related with altruism, well-being of other. Then uh, that uh, no matter how sort of uh, difficult to achieve, but it's a very uh, sort of reasonable. So then uh, determined, like our own struggle. This is not easy. China, a uh, huge country, and militarily very powerful. We, very small people, but our sort of effort, firstly, uh, we think benefit for both, not one-sided. So then, no matter how difficult it is, there is sufficient reason to keep our struggle. Uh, as a result, more and more Chinese now supporting. If we right from the beginning, one-sided, uh, uh, then, then it's difficult to get support. Some Tibetan, the independence of Tibet, independence of Tibet, regardless of what Chinese feel. Then, difficult. So as yesterday I mentioned, we are not saying independence. We fully committed to remain within the people's of China. Provided they must respect the Tibetan culture, Tibetan knowledge, eventually they themselves get immense benefit. So now last, uh, 
over 70 years. We carry that principle. So now, more and more Chinese supporting us. Your so then, self-confidence. Our sort of our aim is something it's something which is beneficial to everyone. Hmm? So then, no matter how difficult it is, we must carry continuously our struggle, non-violent way. As I think yesterday I mentioned, first day ourself should be truthful, honest. That's the basis of our determination. Hmm. Your mind a li little too much uh, clever or cunning. <laughs> it the ultimate, it deep insight, some selfish thing. Then showing something nice to other. Then the uh, very difficult to keep determination, isn't it? And then mm, sometimes you see people through desperate use weapon. The politics you call woman. Your Holiness, uh, hmm? we just covered a lot of topics. <laughs> uh, and I think that one of the common themes that is coming up for good reason, uh, given the challenges that these young leaders face, are questions of leadership, questions of personal resilience. Hmm? You know, personal resilience. How do you stay? How do you keep the inner peace? Uh, and uh, we would like to continue that conversation, mm -hmm. that theme, with this next round of, dis of discussion. And uh, I'd like to ask Naomi to kick us off for this session. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Well, I grew up in a community. I'm Naomi from Nigeria. And I grew up in a community that um, has suffered violence. Okay, so right from when I was three years old, we have known violence. And then um, by the time I was 15, in high school, I decided to start reaching out to victims of insurgents caused by Boko Haram, the ter a terrorist group in northern Nigeria and caused by the Fulani herdsmen attacks, and also had no religious crisis. So there are so many displaced persons in my community. And my family, there were times we couldn't go to school because of 24 hours curfew. So I really, um, I came up with a team and started an organization to reach out to these victims and ensure they have access to quality education. This work sometimes has made me to engage with global leaders and um, I really want to ask you, were there times, you know, because I read your biography fully, and I know you started at the age of 15, fully leading your people. Were there times you got bullied um, by older leaders, international leaders? Were there times you got bullied? And how were you able to, you know, um, go through it and still continue leading your people that are now, ref um, some of them are refugees over here in India. So how were you able to deal with bully and still come back? Because sometimes, like a few times I've gotten bullied and I just cry <laughs> and then just go back. But then um, I really want to continue. So how were you able to do that? Thank you. Kursa. 
Here, according to my own experience, some religious thinking, very helpful. So one of my prayer daily is so long space remain, so long sentient beings suffering remain, I will remain in order to serve them. So that brings tremendous sort of willpower. So one lifetime, some problem here and there is very minor. We determined you know, till you see the uh, sentient being or till even this world disappear, another world or develop. So, so long the sentient being, you know, oh, so long sentient beings suffering remain there. I will remain. So that brings tremendous sort of uh, what's it, uh, willpower. Uh, then, then also one uh, simple advice from uh, one Narendra master: When you face some problem, uh, analyze whether that problem can overcome or not. If if that problem can overcome, the possibility of overcome, then no need worry. Make effort. <laughs> if the problem, no way to overcome, then no use too much worry. <laughs> I think these are the, what's the, of course, I'm not sort of trying to promote Buddhism. Hmm? Me, I'm Buddhist. So, according to my own experience, the altruism, or think more about others' well-being, that thinking, the strong sort of force to reduce self-centered attitude. Most of the emotion which disturb our mind, anger, fear, jealousy, now these related with self-centered attitude. So practitioner, as a practitioner of altruism, the self-centered attitude much weak. So automatically, Fear, anger, hatred, these things, very, very little. So, these are, uh, I think, immense benefit. Then, yesterday, as I mentioned, quantum physics, nothing exists as appears. The all destructive emotion you see, based on appearances, not the reality. So these practice really very, very helpful to keep my mind uh, more peaceful. Not because of that, 
So it's not just enough to I mean, um, pray that, I mean, for peace of mind, but what you need to know is what actually disturbs your peace of mind and then accordingly deal with it, with the, with the tools that can overcome it. I think like a physical illness, uh, just your wish or no longer that illness. I I love Nalanda tradition. Of Thailand, all these country follow of, of Bali tradition. So Bali tradition, foundation of Buddha Dharma. But uh, much depend on faith, respect. Then knowledge tradition, much sort of emphasis, reasoning, reasoning. So I think yesterday I mentioned even Buddha's own word. Investig through investigation, uh, certain Buddha's teaching uh, create contradiction. So we have right to reject that. So the Nalanda tradition always emphasis investigation, investigation. So that very important. Just faith, God, God, God. So our mind then kasoja, betus kasolbe kum if we just pray, then we will not be able to use our mental uh, ability to the extent that we can. So we just rely on God. Mm. So analytical meditation, why, 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 why? And then uh, automatically thinking what's the cause, what's the condition, and further sort of investigation. Uh, whether this, that, cause, that cause can reduce or not. So analytical meditation, why, 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 that's very important. Me personally, uh, that way of thinking, oh, always uh, raise the question, why, 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 very useful. I think they according to knowledge tradition, when Buddha, we met, if if you see this opportunity to meet Buddha, Buddha says something, then our immediate reaction is why? <laughs> we never say yes, 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 no. That's good. You see to utilize human intelligence further, further. So then, more investigation. Uh, the Buddha's teaching, first teachings. Second, I, I already mentioned first Dharma uh, teaching, second Dharma teaching, third Dharma teaching, combine then uh, the sufficient reason uh, how, how to change, how to transform our mind. So we can take these things, academic subject should not consider as a Buddhist sort of practice. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Rebecca and then Bauer if they can contribute. Your Holiness, I'm Rebecca. I was born in Sudan. And in 2011, in 2010, I was internally displaced. I came to South Sudan. And in South Sudan, there are two different cultures, two different people who have different backgrounds. But there is no respect to diversity, there is no respect to culture. 
People are not respecting each other. People are fighting ethnic conflict. At the same time, I visited a refugee camp and I expected everyone there because they ran from war. I expected them to be peacefully. But at the same time, they are fighting. They are hating each other. And on the, on the Tibetan culture, you became a, 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 a leader at a very young age. And you are leading your people in exile. You are leading your people with different people. How did you, like, what are the teachings that you manage teaching your people to love each other with different culture, like with the Indians? Here, I think basically Buddha Dharma, Buddhism, I think, uh, I think immense influence for the Tibetan community. Inside Tibet, as I already mentioned, number of Tibetan. Because it's a social relationship, since 154 self-work emulation. So that's, I think, clear example. They face tremendous suffering and physical suffering, But when we, uh, you see, also the, the uh, face desperate situation, then Tibetan also fought with Chinese soldier quite bravely. And nine, early 1980s, you see, uh, the Ting Shopping uh, start uh, also the uh, connection, the uh, contact, Tibetan inside Tibet and, and outside Tibet. You see, allowed Tibet, Tibetan come here. And from here also, you see, uh, opportunity to go there, meet their relatives. So an old monk, uh, so one occasion I met one old monk, and he told me stories about his own area, many monasteries destroyed by Chinese. Mm -hmm. So then he mentioned uh, thousands, thousands of Chinese soldiers come. So finally, uh, we lost. Mm -hmm. Then I asked, that's understandable, you see, the Chinese soldier were limitless. Mm -hmm. We Tibetan, even one die reduced like that. The Chinese case, thousand die, not much effect. Hmm. And then I asked him if one Chinese, one Tibetan fight, and what, what kind of situation. Then that old monk, oh, surprisingly, told me, oh, chik chik shen, zhengu chung de, dian pu dan se so this monk actually told his honors that uh, if uh, you know, uh, we were to fight one on one, then actually the Tibetans could easily crush the Chinese. Can easily 
that kind of mentality. Uh, and also, in 1950, I think 59, the Chinese so military authority, you see, bring one Chinese uh, division which have experience fought with America, American and Korea. So they bring that division in order to suppress Tibetan. So they themselves just a little bit sort of, how say they, Kasota, they felt fear. Like that. So, uh, a Tibetan. Anyway, I think, uh, like Mongolian, traditionally, more warrior. Whenever oppos oppos opposition come, crush. And after Buddhism reached Tibet, then Tibetan become more compassionate, more peaceful. Now, the number of Chinese also now appreciate Tibetan sort of basic nature, more violent, more non-violence, more compassionate. And then, here, as a handful of refugees, about 100 kazare, Hundred twenty thousand Tibetan refugees here. You see, right from the beginning. Firstly, of course, India is our spiritual home. Oh. Then, secondly, uh, the, uh, it's our nature more compassionate, uh, non-violence, peaceful. So, no problem with Indian people. Very good relations. So Tibetan, not only in India, also is it uh, a few thousand in Switzerland. The local people praising Tibetan, peace, peaceful, hardworking. Then America also. In fact, you see, uh, Pritzka, do you know Pritzka? You know, one, uh, one family member, uh, she told me in Chicago area, uh, they uh, allocate, uh, allocate or some, I think, some group of Tibetan refugees mm, settled there. So that lady told me the very purpose of taking refugees, uh, not just out of sort of concern, their well-being, but they are, I mean, they are, they, their desire is to bring Tibetan community and their peaceful way of life, compassionate life, uh, can uh, spread neighboring Americans. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, in some area in India, the area, the... Uh, what's it? Uh, Tribal area. Tribal, Tribal area. area. As a, once I have been there, as a, some local leader told me, after Tibetan uh, come for settlement, and then local people also becoming more hardworking. So, so they very much appreciate Tibetan sort of nature, peaceful, compassionate, hardworking. So like that. So Tibetan, generally speaking, I think over a thousand years, it's more compassionate. And meantime, hardworking. Like that. So this, I think, our culture, cultural heritage, really, you see, like, uh, So that kind of nature. And now many Chinese very much appreciate Tibetan culture. The hardliner, narrow-minded, then they try to 
eliminate Tibetan unique cultural heritage and including language. Since they feel so long something unique about Tibet remain, they consider that a seat of Tibetan uh, independence struggle. So they eliminate that, but impossible. Now, especially today, a Tibetan culture uh, in the West also, more and more people uh, showing genuine interest among the scientists also. So therefore, the, what's it, the Tibetan culture or Tibetan kumshi way of life, way of life is more and more people now appreciate something positive. So that also now helpful to those hardliner Chinese communists is who try to eliminate Tibetan unique cultural heritage, including language. So now they feel uh, the past uh, over 70 years, their policy, uh, they, many of top leaders, uh, they realize that their policy suppression become more unrealistic and mm, counterproductive. Now they are uh, thinking or discussing uh, more realistic approach about Tibet. So, so Your Holiness, um, uh, Rebecca's question about how people who are displaced as individuals and as communities is a really important one in a world where 70 million people are now forced from their homes from violent conflict. This is a critical issue for our youth leaders. Right. Um, because a lot of them come from countries who are the big contributors to that 70 million. So I'd like to ask uh, both Ferris and Sebastian if we could take both of their comments, because they both are dealing with this issue of how to maintain resilience as individuals and as a community in the face of displacement. Hello, my name is uh, I'm Firas from Syria, and once my uh, one of the most important people for me said to me that the whole, the whole is more greater than the, the sum of all the pieces. So I think this is like how everybody of us, like we are more than each one individual story in our life. I grew up in Damascus, Syria, and I left in, in 2015. I left my home, my people, my family, my friends, and my lovely city, Damascus. Th that was um, like a, something that takes me, uh, like a decision that I took, which is I consider like very important in my life. At, and, uh, at, in, my, in Syria, I've been working to support people uh, who are more vulnerable from the, uh, refugees from all over the world who are staying in Syria, as, all, as well as the Syrians. On my arrival to Turkey, I, real, uh, I realized that these things should continue. And maybe one of the important things that we, uh, I consider here is that be, me being in Turkey, we has so much gratitude to the way that we've been received. And it's like when in our arrival, it was like such a beautiful country and like so much grateful people. So uh, my question for you, Your Holiness, is that as a leader and with uh, all this privilege, you've been in exile for that long, and with all this privilege that you have, how you were able to how you were able to show your gratitude and to make sure uh, to keep the relationship with the host community? Uh, Syria. 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 Syria.
I think in our case, perhaps something unique. Uh, since the 8th century, uh, Buddhism, particularly the Nalanda tradition, is brought to Tibet and I think very well established. Now today's world, the only Tibetan we kept all the famous Nalanda uh, sort of knowledge we kept. So we have some special connection with India. Then, now for example, 1959, when I escaped from Tibet and reached India, in a way, refugee, we lost our own country. But in a way, we uh, reach a country traditionally we Tibetan always respect, like the Muslim world, Mecca is the real source of the Kasota, spiritual, spiritual center, something like that. Uh, India, Budgaya, I think in the past is a Tibetan. Uh, they uh, try to one pilgrimage to Bodhgaya once a life, uh, like that. So then we reach this country uh, as a refugee. But then we really feel now we retu retu return to Indian, our original Kasoda, the spiritual land. And then also, so in our case, the, since 56, I came first time to India, and I developed a very good relation with Indian leaders, President Rajendra Prasa and the Vice President Radhakrishna and the Prime Minister Pandit Nehru, and many Gandhian and freedom fighter. We become very close friends. So, 1959, when we reach Indian border, the India ready to accept. Oh. And since then, I become longest guest of Indian government. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, so then, uh, people, public also, you see, I think wherever they uh, settled, I think local Indian, very friendly and always welcome and appreciate, praising, like that. And our, our own people, disciplined, I think criminal, I think among the, about 100,000 Tibetan. Uh, very few, very peaceful, more compassionate, hardworking. So, I think the Tibetan refugee community is one of the most successful refugee community. And we also carrying the traditional our knowledge. We re-establish the traditional uh, a monastic institution which carry uh, study uh, uh, Buddhist tradition in order to become, I think yesterday I mentioned, in order to become uh, a good scholar at least 30 years, 20, 30 years study. So, 
me. Uh, I think it's better in a way, quite practical. Me, uh, with the name of Dalai Lama, when the ceremony, uh, I sit on throne. Hmm. But when the lesson come, just ordinary monk student. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, threat with weak, like that. So I, I also, you see, I took 13 years study. Uh, then after become refugee, I continuously uh, re-study these books. Very useful. We have uh, 300 volumes, all translation from India. These we consider our text. So even these days, I always reading. Most of these books, of course, about 100 volume, uh, Buddha's own word. Then about 200 uh, volumes, the Nalanda Masters. So as I mentioned earlier, they always you see, because uh, because point out where point yeah. out through reason through reason. So wonderful. So we kept all these. Now today in South India, uh, monastic institution re-established the number of monk students, over 10,000 monk students who studied in these at least 20 years. And then also we start all nunnery, also not should start a serious study. So now in the last few years, we all already achieved uh, the non Kishin degree. Kasure. Nuns who have um, got, uh, obtained a, like a PhD degree. Oh. One story. Uh, when I thinking, nunnery also should study uh, similar monk study. Uh, so some. Uh, so my friend, they say, oh, any kishi continues. In the beginning, when his own has expressed the wish to have his nuns, you know, becoming kishis or, the, you know, like uh, someone who has PhD degree, some of the elder monks were actually quite uh, speculative about it. How oh. can that be? So uh, Then I told them, Buddha give us equal nuns, monks, bhikshu, Bhikshuni, same rank. So now, for study also, we should be equal. So my reason, more sort of wait, so they keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of women leaders here who are taking heart. <laughs> So as you know, uh, longest guest of Indian government, now my latest my commitment is try to revive of ancient Indian knowledge, not through monastery, but through school, college, education. I, I have sort of a conviction, India is the only nation who can combine modern education and ancient Indian education about mind. Uh, over 3,000 years, uh, India's concept of nonviolence and compassion, karuna, ahimsa. So that now world need. So in order to uh, show world uh, these useful ancient Indian thought, firstly, within India should survive. So I fully committed. So many Indian uh, institutions now very much appreciate. They fully support me. So that's my uh, now latest on my what's it, uh, commitment. I have so four commit. I think I already mentioned yesterday. Uh, number one commitment, I consider I am a human being. Uh, one of the seven billion human beings. So try to promote 
uh, basic human value. That's human compassion. Uh, not touch with religion as academic. Uh, so in a secular way, uh, no differences, believer or non-believer. So long we are human being, we need inner peace. For that, we need some knowledge how to tackle our emotion. That's my number one commitment. Oh, that's uh, basically number one commitment. And second commitment, I already mentioned, religious, promotion of religious harmony. Then, oh, one day, one time in Delhi, some Muslim uh, sort of uh, group, and including the uh, Muslim countries, embassies, uh, some people come, and we all discuss. And then at the, uh, at the end, we took pilgrimage to Kasa Kasa Jamamati, uh, big Muslim temple. So we all together uh, take pilgrimage. And they put me on white Muslim head, yes. And then uh, pray together with other Muslim friends. The next day, the newspaper with picture, a lot of sort of, I said, the report. Mm -hmm. uh, like that. So, since 74, 75, I start one practice wherever I go. If there is a, a, a different uh, of the temple, church, Hindu temple, Sikh temple, Buddhist temple, and other uh, Jewish temple, hmm, we always go for uh, pilgrimage. Uh, then, second, you see from time to time, uh, academic level, discuss with uh, people from different traditions. So that's the way uh, to, to promote religious harmony. So, so many, uh, among my friend, many Muslims, <laughs> So philosophical field is the differences. But we all practitioner of love, loving kindness. So no problem. So Your Holiness, uh, Sebastian yes. will follow. So good day, nice to meet you, Your Holiness. My name is Sebastian Huertas from Colombia. Uh, in 2016, the peace agreement is started by the Nobel of Peace, Juan Manuel Santos. Um, my country are divided in two. One, one country that believe in peace, another part of, doesn't believe in peace. So that's the reason because a lot of social leaders was killed like me. More or less, 50,000, 50, leaders are killed. So that's the reason because I want to be senator to, in Colombia in 2022, because for me it's the best way to continue the peace building in Colombia. So my question for you is because you have the experience as a refugee to come into here. How do you promote the, the spiritual peace and reconciliation, not promoting hate to the Tibetan people? Can you repeat? Can you repeat Okay. So how do you promote the spiritual peace and reconciliation, no promoting hate as the Tibetan people? So, because he wants to be to do the same to the the to the to the to to the to the to the Violence, basically, no proper reason 
violence is what was say, instrument of anger. No proper base. Think more, it becomes weak, weak. So non-violence is peace. Peace related with compassion. The sufficient reason. I think now today's world, I think generally speaking, everywhere people really I think fed up violence. So only a question of time. Uh, you should not lose your determination. Keep determination uh, and and more information, uh, if possible, some this kind of meeting in your own country. And then uh, I think time time passes, I think things will change, certainly. So. For example, my own case, uh, when we decide not seeking independence, so some people criticize. Uh, now gradually, uh, I think many Tibetans, I think, fully understand we are not seeking independence, separation. Emotionally, we want independence. And now here, one important is, according uh, to Chinese history book, hmm. uh, so some scholar, Chinese, uh, I, know, I know some of them. You see, they told me 7th century, 8th century, 9th century, three independent countries, China, Mongolia, Tibet. And then in Chinese ancient history book, they never mention Tibet part of China. They say, but okay, past is past. Huh. So we have some unique cultural heritage. I, I already mentioned, I think, yesterday. So uh, it's even sort of benefit to Chinese brothers, sisters to keep this tradition, then okay. So, uh, so we always keep our determination. So originally, some young Tibetans criticized me. Then gradually, they understand my way of sort of approach. And then our elected political leaders also fully support now following that, that way, that path, not seeking independence, but some mutual benefit like that. Okay. Achoo. Thank you, Your Holiness. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to have this chance to sit next to you and talk to you. I come from South Sudan, and um, I don't see uh, one element that has shaped me in a way or another. I see a, a set, Pasla. a component of many things that made me the person I am today. So uh, I grew up in Sudan, and uh, it's a very complex country. It has been the biggest country in Africa. And we have African people who look like me, with Afri Afro hair, kinky. And we also have Arabs. We have Muslims and Christians. Um, and through that, I faced a lot of discrimination, um, violence. And um, it got to some extent that I faced domestic violence, even from people I know within my family. Um, however, I was always asking myself, why, why? Because you said we should ask ourselves, why, why always? But every time I ask why, I'm considered to be a rebel. Because I want to know why is this person oppressing me? Why is this person rejecting me? And um, this developed in me self-resilience. I always wanted to do what they told me not to do. <laughs> and I grew up like that. So I went to university and I had to cover up everything, although I'm Christian, but I covered it up because of Islam, Sharia law. Um, it went like that. Through university, I faced another type of conflict, which was me being a woman. So I wanted to lead my students. I, I went for election to become their student president, but they did not vote for me because I'm a woman. <laughs> 
And I was also very young by then, I think at the age of 18. I did not give up, so the next year I changed my strategies and I won. Yeah, and um, this also gave me hope. So now me and some other colleagues, we work on how to promote women's education because I believe education helped me a lot not to hate the people who oppressed me and rejected me. Then we moved to South Sudan, and it was even more complicated because my own people, the South Sudanese, now discriminate against me coming from Sudan because they were fighting with the Sudanese. And this has created self-conflict in me. So I, 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 I relate to Sudanese people, and I also relate to South Sudanese people. Um, in all that, my mother gave me so much force, and she's the reason behind my strength. I'm very passionate and compassionate because of the love I saw in her. And um, in one of your videos, I saw how, when you were so young, how you used to run when the three leaders came to your house and you were hiding behind your mom's scene. Um, so I want, I want you to tell me what, um, what's the role of women into shaping you becoming the person you are today, apart from your mother. And also you mentioned that um, one, in, one of your BBC interviews, you said maybe the next Dalai Lama will be a woman. Mm -hmm. So I want you to tell me the impact of this on the Tibetan community and how this might cause conflict or change your history. Yeah, thank you. Kasha. Yesterday, I already, I think, mentioned the uh, we seven billion human beings on this planet. We really need effort to promote basic human value. That is human compassion. Uh, this can be possible because basic human nature. We are social animal. So basic human nature is more compassionate. This according scientist. Uh, so uh, I think next few days I am going to meet the rigid division, uh, the specialist about the brain. Mm -hmm. Now I want to, uh, if I want to suggest to him I think he should carry uh, more research work, compassionate mind, uh, how much sort of effect our brain, anger, how harmful our brain. This is not a religious matter, but our health. Mm. So uh, my number one, uh, commitment, as I mentioned earlier, is a promotion of this basic human value. I believe basic human nature is more compassionate. Therefore, it is possible. The only thing, as I mentioned earlier yesterday, uh, existing education, no bother about our internal emotions. Uh, so, my uh, so female now should take more sort of effort 
for promotion of compassionate society. Then I always believe mother is first our teacher. Oh, in my case, my mother is the key person who practical practical level showed me compassion. So sometimes, you know, my mother's sort of compassion a little bit spoiled me. I think I mentioned Oh. The reason uh, my my area, very small village, and then of course no toys, nothing. So my mother always carry me wherever my mother go, or milking animal, or because uh, of look after so farm farm work. My mother always carry me. So eventually, I found very comfortable on my mother's shoulder. <laughs> so then I become a little bolder. So I hold my mother's two ear if I want to go this side. <laughs> if go this side. If mother not sort of follow my instruction, then I shout. So my mother, too kind, so that boy, a little bit spoiled. <laughs> but I always was telling people, first my teacher about compassion is my mother. That's very clear. <laughs> huh? I think everywhere, even animal, mother, take care till they are youngster become independent. Otherwise, you say birds or dogs or any uh, animal like that. So therefore, the mother is the symbol of loving kindness. So a female uh, should not you see, involve only concern family level, but look, society try to promote this deeper human value. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, so, this would be. So, 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 oh, yes. So, one time uh, in Paris, one a female. Casa magazine. Uh, they asked me uh, in future, Dalai Lama can be female. Then I mentioned, oh yes, of course, is the female uh, more sort of useful, female Dalai Lama? Then certainly female Dalai Lama. Then as far as the Dalai Lama institution is, institution is concerned, I think. As early as 69, I think 69, I official my statement. I mentioned whether the Dalai institution should continue or not up to Tibetan people. Uh, it's not, not important. The important is learning. Knowledge is more important than just the institution. In the feudal system, old, old time, Yes, institution is something important. Dalai Lama institution also related with that. So now imp not much important. The important is study, student. Now, as I mentioned earlier, over 10,000 students study. So these people, now, uh, firstly, no Buddha's institution. Uh, many of Nalanda masters, uh, they have no institution. I think reincarnation recognized as a sort of previous uh, person, and then institution started, I think, in Tibet because of the feudal system, I feel. So, uh, so future, 
uh, Dalam institution they should continue or not concern the people including Mongolian and Ch- I think mainly Mongolian the very word Dale Dalai Lama Dale Mongolian word so if they sort of withdraw their support and then I cannot sign signature Dalai Lama Dalai Lama Dalai Lama <laughs> 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 so some special connection, the Mongolian and, and Tibet. Uh, so they also have the sort of historically some right about Dalai Lama institution or Rohingya nation. So now regarding Dalai Lama Rohingya nation, um, I think uh, next month some highest uh, Tibetan uh, Lama or spiritual leaders we're going to have some uh, gathering or meeting. So, uh, at the previous time, I suggested, uh, so when my age reach around 90, then I will so the convene or the spiritual leaders. Then uh, let them discuss about future Dharam institution and reincarnation. But theoretically, the female reincarnation, uh, very possible if the circumstances are uh, uh, more, as I mentioned earlier, more sort of effort from female side for promotion of human compassion, then uh, female Dalai Lama. Uh, firstly, Dalai Lama Institute should continue. Then, uh, the, the successor of Dalai Lama institution open whether uh, or traditional way to choose reincarnation or his holiness pope sort of a tr- tradition among the high cardinal and elected. That's also possible. Uh, so there are some different kasuda. Or options, options. Yes, like, like that. So then, then you see one problem. When the, uh, the French magazine asked me in future any female Dalai Lama, then I mentioned, yes, if female Dalai Lama comes, that Dalai Lama must be very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> then that report, some Indian, some Indian lady criticized me. It's true. If Dalai Lama, a female Dalai Lama, blah, 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 <laughs> then people, I think, avoid to see uh, that Dalai Lama. Isn't it? So, more handsome Dalai Lama, uh, female. I think much better. It's common sense. <laughs> but some people used to criticize that. I don't know. What is the reason? Uh, so, my own case, uh, if my face is something, oh, something sort of very ugly, then people not much fun to see me. But my 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 face quite handsome, <laughs> <laughs> and always smile, always smile, always smile. So people loves is seeing me like that. So so uh, so future Dalai Lama. Not my concern, just the concerned people. You see, they will decide. My own concern is my next life should be as first Dalai Lama express. He no want, no wish to born heaven, but place more suffering there and where he can uh, serve something. He always want to born such uh, sort of uh, good place. So me also, they are not something high institutional like that, but one human being uh, who can serve more people. <coughs> That's so long space remain, so long sentence beings remain, I will remain in order to serve. Okay. 
We have two. We have two final questions, so yes. we'll take both of them together. And I know we're getting close to lunch, so. So, uh, Your Holiness, when I was uh, uh, like, my mother taught me how you should be a value-driven person. And uh, while I was growing up, I also uh, uh, realized how it feels to lose someone. So. I uh, started an organization where uh, I teach, like, teach values like empathy, inclusiveness, nonviolence to uh, youth, to children, and to teachers. Because I was following what my mother told me to be value driven, but I faced a lot of violence, I faced a lot of criticism, I faced a lot of uh, like, I used to question myself, uh, like, if I am value-driven, what difference I am making? So I thought one person cannot make a difference. Like, one person is value-driven but cannot make a difference. Everyone needs to be have those values. So I have, uh, like, I went to Kashmir, uh, worked with the youth there. Their stories were very depressing, like the kind of conditions they are condition they are staying in. I also work with Rohingya refugee. They used to show the videos from Burma where their family members, like a pregnant woman, was first her stomach was uh, they like took out the baby, killed the baby, and then killed the mother. So they used to question me that you want uh, us to be value driven you want us to be compassionate why so holiness my question is uh, to you that uh, you also uh, people come to you and ask such problems and such issues from you what uh, what gives you energy to uh, move forward, wake up every day with the same energy. Yeah, thank you. And then, and then, and then, Mm -hmm. But let's take bar ones as well. Mm -hmm. Bauer, I am from. I think first, let me go bathroom. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Monastery library yesterday, so we'll, we'll go there to observe the debate. The cars will be lined up there. As soon as we finish the debate, 
we will get into the cars. I will go to TCP. Okay. So please uh, try to be as fast as we can today. Okay. So timing wise, very uh, tight. Very tight today. Welcome back. Welcome back. While you're getting settled, we'll, we'll ask Bauer to go Hello. ahead. My name is Bauer. I am from Kurdish, Kurdistan, a Kurdish citizen. I'm a member of a group that we want to educate our people to keep environment. We as Kurds have always wanted to be peaceful and to promote peace. And I believe that no, no one as your holiness and the other Tibetans will understand our sufferings and our pains. Throughout many decades, we have been either an immigrant in other countries or we, are, we were being serving the immigrants of the other countries in our motherland. Uh, if you have one China, we have also four little Chinas against us. So my question by the name of the old youth here and by the name of the Generation Change Fellow of USIP is how to, what's your suggestion, what's your advice so that we could be able to, uh, to keep our hope so that we could be able to contribute to our peace building activities? Of course, I admire this is the Kurdish people, by the way. Kurdish mm -hmm. people, they are, what's the oh, determination to keep your own culture, uh, no matter. I think you, Kurdish people, some in Syria, some in Iraq, Iraq some in Turkey, some in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, India. Hmm? Like I think Jewish people, is they uh, scattered in different places, but uh, under difficult circumstances they kept their culture heritage, and mainly in the family level. So now uh, we are twenty first century. I think not like the 20th century is thinking power. So, the, your determination, very important. Then eventually, I think you can achieve all goodish people, different country, united. Sometimes I sort of express uh, some of my Mongolian friend Unified Inner Mongolia, Outer Mongolia, same race, same language, same culture. Or politically, Outer Mongolia, independent, or Inner Mongolia, part of China. So in the future, possible, United Mongolia. So similarly, Kurdish people, I think eventually possible. 
on United. So different culture, including language, uh, that through centuries you should develop. You see, that will remain. So different identity with different culture remain. So this, uh, now I also you see, feel you know, some, some occasion I sort of express the United Nation, mainly world body, mainly government. Now eventually I think some like United Nation, mainly people sort of gathering, and if possible headed by Nobel laureate. Hmm? Nothing to do with government, hmm. but people from different continent and different countries, some kind of united world body. Sometimes I feel, but I don't know. That may be dream. So that in United Nation, present is in United Nation. Uh, I also briefly mentioned yesterday. Right? Oh, uh, um, in any case, mainly representative of the country or government. So unfortunately, sometimes government cannot represent the people. So we need, if possible, some kind of uh, world body uh, of the people. So as I mentioned yesterday, mentioned uh, uh, some sort of, cause of cause of something like something like European Union, African Union, Northern African Union, uh, Latin American Union. I think we should think some union. Then all these different union, another sort of, or say another body. Inter international level. So it is important to keep your own different culture, different language. Very important to keep. Huh? Oh, Kazakh, which word? Yes, I think uh, I think I already sort of mentioned the looks holistic, open, not just constant suffering, suffering, then demoralize. But open, yes, it is sad, or uh, period of suffering. But the suffering, not permanent, always change. And uh, here, I think the uh, one Nagarjuna's theory, or Buddha's own sort of, was the teaching theory. Everything depends on other factor. So that Sanskrit word, patit samabhant, everything interdependent, nothing absolute. So therefore, the uh, today sort of so the immense suffering due to different sort of uh, causes or conditions. So we can change that. So suffering not permanent. It depends on causes and conditions. Causes and conditions we can change. So there's always hope. I think what I mean the nature when we face some suffering, only look that that anger, then more frustration, hopelessness. Uh, when we face some problem, we accept this problem, this suffering, but meantime look from various sort of anger more wider perspective, then uh, you can uh, see possibility of change.
So that gives you hope. People who will suffer only that that aspect. Look that aspect. So now lunch. Your Your Holiness, this this concludes our fourth dia- dialogue with you and the Generation Change Fellows, and we can't thank you enough. You've given us a lot to think about as a global voice and leader for peace, and your advice and wisdom about how to maintain personal resilience, uh, about how to maintain their personal commitment, uh, equal rights, especially I think you've encouraged the women leaders among us, Um, but they are all committed to being leaders. They've each brought their own questions to you, uh, individual questions that represent the specific conflict areas that they live and work in. Um, But there's definitely a commonality in terms of how to connect with the compassion of an open heart that brings that resilience and determination. We cannot thank you enough. Um, But I'd like to invite my colleagues from the U.S. Institute of Peace to give you a small token of our appreciation for the ongoing partnership uh, that we have Mm -hmm. with you and your office. I think uh, we should think uh, the time never stand still, always moving. Uh, past beyond our control. The future still in our control, in our hand. So in order to uh, change the future, present, we must sort of use it we should do to the best of our ability to try to use our brain. So then, the, as we already discussed, is the present condition uh, not very peaceful, not very happy one. So this, mainly our own creation, then that part, you see, we can change. So think, you should not think things now already there. Now I can't, I can't do anything. I can't do it. Not thinking that. We should try to explore. Explore. And thinking uh, various sort of ways of what uh, this way, this way, that way, that way. That's the value of human brain. Uh, we should not sort of demoralize and remain like that. Should not do that. Mm. And then ancient time, small community, more or less isolated. Now today, not no longer that kind of situation. So through technology, through uh, and personal contact, you see, now something like. Seven billion human beings are one human community. So they all some sort of a certain sort of habit from century old can change. Uh, deeper awareness, more realistic. So I love revolution. Change, change, change. <laughs> Yes. Oh, ka. Ka. I don't know. Okay.
Your Holiness, we also, there are so many people who made this possible. And so I want to give our heartfelt thanks and gratitude to um, a, a number of people, including your audiovisual team, led by Don Eisenberg and Tenjin uh, uh, Cho Chojar. Um, we'd like to thank your security team. We'd like to thank the, um, yeah, okay. The, for the, for the audiovisual team, the security team, your wonderful chefs who have fed us lunch. Uh, the Nam Yul Monastery for serving us tea and taking care of us. We need to give a huge thanks from the heart for Libby and Calden. They really make this possible for us. Um, I need to once again thank our USIP team of Allison, Ingrid, Liz, uh, Rebecca, David, and Eva. Uh, and I also want to thank Annie and Nacho, who have been an important part of our team. And a big, big thanks uh, to the Office of His Holiness, uh, especially for Jimmy Ringsen, uh, Seton, and Tenzin. And we would like to present them with some small tokens of our appreciation. Chimila, Tenzin, Seton. Yeah. We know how much effort you put into making this possible, and we're so very grateful for your support for four years now. Tenzin. <laughs> and to and to the, your and to all of your office. Um, so once again, the the inspiration that you've provided, I think, has given a lot of food for thought. Uh, we will, I think, all be thinking about this, contemplating it, taking great heart and great determination. Yeah. Thank you.